Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. And uh, I apologize in my enthusiasm as I started putting this together. I think I'm quite certain I included too many slides. So at, at some point, I'll probably have to accelerate a little bit. But uh, I really got into kind of going over the history of this phenomenon. And uh, so I included a lot. Um, uh, to <laughs> I also have a bit of a cold, so if I start coughing, please forgive me. Uh, as I'm sure everybody knows, uh, people have been doing twin studies of human ability for more than a century now. And studies of that kind using identical and fraternal twins are more or less unanimous uh, in establishing that uh, IQ, if that's what we're talking about, has a substantial heritability. Uh, and Often, even more, we've gotten kind of used to the idea that there's a genetic component to most everything we study in humans, um, and for IQ as well. But I think what's, what's often more problematic and what leads to deeper philosophical problems in understanding the genetic, genesis of ability is how hard it's been to find substantial effects of the shared family environment, that is, of siblings being raised together in the same family. Uh, the effects, even in children, are often quite small, and they often go away to entirely zero uh, by the time people reach middle adolescence. Uh, and the, the problem with this is that when we think about doing things to help the cognitive functioning of people, we usually address, want to address variables that ought to be shared environmental variables in families. And if the effect of twin studies is to show that there are no shared effects of families, it creates a problem for how, the, how these interventions are supposed to work. And I, I won't go through the Arthur Jensen stuff, but back in the 70s when people started being skeptical of environmental interventions on genetic ground, this was uh, a very important basis of it. Um, this is a picture of the classical twin model that I'll spend most of the time today expanding on. Uh, but just that I, I, I guess there are probably a few people out there who maybe haven't been over the basics of the classical twin model. The, uh, the classical twin design uses identical and fraternal twins to uh, analyze variability. And it's very important to remember that we're always analyzing variability here, differences among people into three independent components. Uh, A, which is the genetic component, it stands for additive, the additive effect of uh, many small individual genes. Uh, that correlation between the twins is 1.0 in identical twins and 0.5 in fraternal twins. Uh, C, the one I was just talking about, which is the, sometimes known as the shared environment, C stands for common, uh, and represents the environmental effects of families, environmental effects that make children raised in the same family alike, and E, which is everything else. Uh, the non-shared environment, it's often thought of as environmental effects that make kids raised in the same family different, but it's also measurement error, for example. It's uh, everything else that makes people different. Um, and just to start with something I wrote about a long, long time ago about another reason why the basic literature here is problematic. Um, uh, studies within groups of people often appear to be substantially genetic. That is, identical twins are almost always more highly correlated than fraternal twins. Uh, adopted away children are more highly correlated with their biological parents than their adoptive parents. Uh, on the other hand, between group differences usually appear largely environmental. Uh, if you study changes in the mean of IQ in adopted children who are adopted, as children usually are, away from poorer families and into better off families, the mean of their IQ usually goes up. And that, that can be taken as an environmental effect. Uh, randomized, randomized studies of Head Start or the Absidarian Project, where children are randomized to special environmental interventions, often show an environmental effect. I think maybe in the interest of time, I'll skip over the Flynn effect, which is simply that the mean of IQ has been going up over the last 75 years or so, which is obviously an environmental effect. Um, 
And one possible, this is an old slide of mine, and I, I left it in here because I'm going to tell you at the end of the talk that I think it's wrong. Uh, it's, it's my old explanation for why within and between analyses of, uh, of cognitive ability come out differently. And that possibility was that perhaps the relationship between environment on the x-axis here and IQ on the y-axis is nonlinear. With a steep slope in a region that we might think of as the impoverished region here, that levels off at the high end. Now, if that were the case, and you were looking at correlations, say, with adopted, adoptive families uh, who are selected to be at least middle class, those correlations would all be up here on the right, and the, I can't point, and the uh, environmental correlations would be quite low. On the other hand, if you were looking at mean differences between groups of children who were raised in the region on the left where there's the steep drop off and the region on the right, you would find mean differences that look environmental. Uh, when, when I first started doing this research, there were two obvious shortcomings of typical twin studies of cognitive ability. First of all, impoverished twins or impoverished adoptive families are very unusual. Um, it's obviously the case for adoption that very poor people, for better or for worse, don't get to adopt children. It's also the case that until very recently, most twin studies did not, did not include any poor people. Uh, twin studies were either based on volunteer samples of twins uh, and people volunteering for studies were almost by definition middle class or better, or they were based on big population registers in Scandinavia, where fortunately for them, they don't have the kind of economic inequality that we have here. Uh, also, you probably thought when I was showing you that picture of the classical twin model, that that's a very, very simple model of how genes and environment might work together in the development of a trait has been pointed out many, many times. Um, it assumes that the contributions of genetic and environmental differences are linear, which they're almost certainly not, and additive, which they're almost certainly not, and independent, which they're almost certainly not. So we're going to violate some of those assumptions as we go ahead. Uh, and an interesting thing about this whole phenomenon that I'm going to talk today uh, is that I didn't discover it. Uh, uh, I had a role in popularizing it, but I didn't discover it. And I think it's correct to say that the person who did discover it was the great behavior geneticist at, uh, not at the time, but later here at the University of Virginia, Sandra Scar, uh, who in fact hired me in my current position. And in, I'm going to do this very quickly, in 1971 in science, Cy a the classic, uh, Oh, no, let's go over that. She wasn't citing a 1998 paper in 1971. Um, she did a study of twins, re twins enrolled in the Philadelphia school system uh, and hypothesized. Uh, she was told where this is the last time we're going to talk about race here. She was talking about primarily race and that uh, she hypothesized that the heritability of intelligence of, in the form of achievement test scores in the kids um, should be lower in the African-American kids than in the white kids because they were raised in poverty. Um, and lo and behold, that turned out to be the case. Uh, you just take my word for it instead of going over all the details of this slide. Um, it was in, I mean, it was a groundbreaking study, obviously. It was also very limited, primarily because she didn't have access to the zygosity of the twins. Um, she just had kids with the same last name and the same birth date. And she had to use a bunch of old-fashioned and not wrong, but very low power methods to estimate uh, where the identical and fraternal twins were in the sample. Uh, that was, as I said, in 1971. She published a couple of papers on the phenomenon. And the, it then kind of lay fallow for quite a while. There were a few related reports out of Sweden that I won't get into. But then in 1999, in AdHealth, in the Adolescent Health and Development Study uh, in the United States, the, the late David Rowe um, and Kristen Jacobson uh, published a, a very straightforward study looking at the heritability of intelligence test scores in ad health, which uh, 
intelligence in ad health comes from the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test uh, as a function of the level of the parental education of the twins. Um, and showed that as parent education went up proceeding from left to right on the x-axis, the heritability of IQ went up. Uh, <clears throat> at about that time, I had access to something called the National Collaborative Perinatal Project, which was actually an NIH project um, back in the 70s that was a very modern-like study in many ways. Uh, it was a study of 45,000 children born to, I think, 30,000 mothers uh, across a carefully selected set of hospitals around the United States. Um, the, the mothers were overweighted for low socioeconomic status. And in the normal course of it, it was not a twin study, in the normal course of events, there were, depending on how you count, four to 600 pairs of twins born. Uh, my old advisor, Lee Willerman, uh, had, had worked on it for NIH back in the 70s. Um, so he encouraged me as I was moving from graduate school to UVA to uh, have a look at the twin and ad they gave, and they gave IQ scores to the kids at ages four and seven, which is how long they followed them. Uh, Stanford Binet at four and a Wexler intelligence test at seven. And just little anecdote, it was the, turned out to be a very, very lucky event in my life. I, I, I conducted this study. We were writing up our results when I bumped into, in a random meeting, a guy named this guy on this slide named Rick Weiss, who was the time the science editor uh, at the Washington Post. And I got to talking to him about it. And he said, oh, we maybe run a little study about it, and uh, a little story about it. And that story wound up on the front page of the Sunday Washington Post. And so I've gotten way too much credit for this phenomenon over the years, thanks to that funny little coincidence. Uh, anyway, the NCPP, uh, uh, I got the numbers wrong when I was talking before. It was 53,000 children born to 44,000 mothers, followed for by, for seven years, Stanford, Binet, WISC, a very wide range of tests. They were given some achievement tests, all sorts of other stuff in there, too. We'll go by that on a slide later fairly quickly. Uh, 600 twin pairs, 320 in this analysis, uh, people who were followed up, who were given a seven-year examination for whom zygosity was known. Uh, that was not as easy a thing to know back then as it is now. Um, uh, and what was most interesting about these twins is that a lot of them were from poor families. That made them very unusual. Uh, the median education of the moms was uh, only 10 and a half years of education. Uh, there was a quarter with less than ninth grade. Uh, I won't dwell, but there were a lot of poor moms and dads there. Uh, there were quite a high proportion of teen moms, uh, unmarried moms, uh, kids living in crowded households, et cetera. Uh, they had a socioeconomic status score that they adopted from Miriam Thopolis and French uh, that was just a very typical mean of education, income, and an occupation rating. Uh, I often start here. That's just a plot of uh, arbitrary twin one against arbitrary on the x-axis versus arbitrary twin two on the y-axis with, I hope you can see the colors okay, that the blue Ds are the DZ twins and the red Ms are the MZ twins. And you notice that the red MZ twins are closer to the uh, middle of the scatter plot, which is the heritability of IQ at work. Um, that's a very typical plot of the IQ scores by family socioeconomic status. Uh, and note, it's, it turns out, I don't think I'll get into it much, it turns out to be very important methodologically in this field, that socioeconomic status is something that is necessarily the same for both of the twins in the study. This is their parents' socioeconomic status. These are kids who were raised together. So if you think about it as a hierarchical linear model, uh, SES is a family, it's a level two family level variable. Uh, that 
has the effect actually of making the analysis itself much much easier because if you if you study SES and IQ in adults for example in adult twin pairs the twin pairs no longer have the same SES uh, and that complicates everything for better or for worse um, this, this is my, to this day, when I open up a data set of these kind of data, this is the first plot that I draw. Uh, I'm, I'm very fond of studying, doing twin studies in terms of absolute pair differences. So the less correlated twins are for a trait, the more different they are. So the larger the, larger the absolute value of the difference between the twin pairs. And so this is a plot. You notice that the y-axis is uh, all positive. It's a plot of the absolute difference for twin pairs plotted for MZ in red and DZ in blue as a function of the socioeconomic status of the parents. And the red line is lower than the blue line, which is to say the MZ twins are more similar than the DZ twins, which is once again the heritability of intelligence at work. But what you notice is, and uh, it's the difference between those two lines that's showing you the heritability of intelligence. And what you notice is that as you get over on the right, the difference starts to get greater and greater. And that's the heritability of intelligence going up. And everything else I'm going to tell you is basically that phenomenon. Uh, this is another, I haven't shown these slides in a while. This is a another old slide of the of the way, as it turns out, we used to fit the model where we've taken, this is just one twin, and we've taken the classical ACE model with the A, C, and E paths to the phenotype. And we've included an interaction off to, at least it's on my left, uh, that all roots through SES. And that has the effect of modifying the twin correlations in terms of their interaction with SES. It's as simple as that. that the, that the effect, the additive effect of genes on IQ is now a main effect plus a part of a, a part that is moderated by socioeconomic status in a, as a typically normal multiplicative interaction. Um, and when we looked at the results, what we found, we now once again have SES from 0 to 100 on the x-axis and uh, this is now the variance of full-scale IQ on the y-axis. This is an unstandardized analysis. Uh, the, this is a WEX, this is the WISC. So it's a Wexler test with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15, so a population variance of 225. Um, and so we can literally partition that raw variance into A, C, and E components. And this is what happens to those components over SES. And what you see is that a on the left among the very poorest families, the genetic component is essentially zero. And on the right, in the best off families, the shared environmental component is essentially zero. Um, verbal IQ, something very similar happens, but uh, those results are not in and of themselves significant. And performance IQ, something very similar happens, and that one is significant. And verbal plus performance is significant together. Uh, you can also, <laughs> I think most of the time, it's better to do these analyses in terms of the raw unstandardized variances, or actually we've come to completely new ways to do them that we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, but really, the, the typical way to think about these numbers is in terms of standardized so-called heritability coefficients, which is the proportion of the total phenotypic variance that is attributed to A, so some amount over the total 225. Uh, and in fact, doing it that way, because A, the A variance is going up and the C variance is going down, when you standardize them into a single proportion, it magnifies the effect. And it is quite dramatic. The proportion of the variance attributable to genes goes from, again, close to zero among the poorest families to close to 100% among the best off. This, this sample, just by the way, is easy. It's easy for me to talk about children going from poor or to rich. They don't really. Uh, this sample goes more from poor to middle class. They're really, 
is no more than a smattering of wealthy people in the whole sample, just by the way. Uh, the largest effects point of information, though we're, I'm interested in this right now because we're uh, looking at these kind of questions in, in some new data sets right now. The, the ones with the largest interaction effects where poverty seems to be making the biggest difference is in the educational tests, which I think is interesting. I think schools are a huge driver of this effect. Um, so that was in 2003. Uh, we spent the better part of the next 10 years replicating the effect as best we could uh, in a variety of places. The ways that this effect has replicated and not replicated is a very interesting story in and of itself. I'm not necessarily going to focus entirely on that, though it's going to come up in a number of different ways. Uh, uh, the National Merit data set is a very famous older data set uh, that was utilized extensively by another one of my grad school mentors back in Texas, uh, John Lowen, who I'm glad to say is still around. Uh, and working. Uh, he wrote a very well-known book about personality on the basis of it, um, the National Merit Sample. Uh, but they actually had the, the National, Mer National Mer Merit Scholarship Qualification Test, the NMSQT, uh, on a fairly large sample of pairs and immediately upon publishing the 2003 paper, he got in touch and said, well, we should look at it here. And through all these replications, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go fast in the interest of finishing it. Uh, this was because this, these were kids in the 50s and 60s taking the National Merit Test. They were much better off than the Collaborative Project kids. Um, uh, these are the subtests. They're they're much more educational than a than a Wechsler test, reading, writing, and arithmetic kind of stuff. Um, that's the univariate twin results, which are very very typical. Um, maybe just look down at the bottom. You know, that's a heritability of 0.5. Doing it in my head as I sit here. Um, and there is some C in there, some shared family environmental effects too, of maybe 0.4 or so. Uh, in this, one thing, it's, it's a, a funny thing about uh, doing it this way. I don't have a natural sense out looking at you how many of you are path modelers. Um, this, for this, for the first time, we did something that we're still doing today and still trying to improve upon today. We did this as a multivariate test rather than as a univariate test. That is. This is a latent common factor that we fit over the five subtests. I did this was under the direction of Paige Harden now the, at the University of Texas, um, and uh, well, and there are a number of. I mean, you get a lot more statistical power when you do it that way, and it's a good thing because these studies are generally underpowered. And a just interesting replication note about all of this is that these studies can be very hard to do because if you do the analysis five times underpowered on the five different subtests, you're going to get five different answers. And it's very easy to get lost in, well, we got the effect for math. We didn't get the effect for English. And I ultimately don't really think that any of that means anything. Uh, it makes much more sense to simply fit a common factor since that's what we're powered to study and uh, study the phenomenon at that level. Um, and lo and behold, the same thing happens. Uh, the heritability, not quite as dramatically. And as we'll see when we get to the meta-analysis, um, unsurprisingly, uh, our NCPP study that made a big splash, in part it made a big splash because the effect is unusually large there. Uh, that's the way it happens. And when the people then start to try and replicate it, uh, the effect that they find goes down, it's the winner's curse. Um, but fortunately, it remains substantial and non-zero. And heritability increased more from in the little under 0.4 to a little over 0.5, where the effect of families decreased in about the same range. Uh, 
this I seem to be got slides repeating here for some reason. That's good. That'll move me along. Uh, remind me, if whoever's listening, to edit that out before you publish it. Um, Another NIH, uh, NICHD supported study, I believe, I hope I'm getting that right, is the ECLS, the Early Childhood Longitudinal Study. There are two cohorts, the kindergarten cohort, which is ongoing, and the birth cohort, which is unfortunately not. But the, it was the birth cohort that uh, had the best data on the twins in the study. Um, and under the direction of my student, Paige, and our UVA graduate student and Paige's husband, Elliot Tucker Job, now also at UT, uh, we undertook a series of analyses of uh, the ECLS. And I'm going to be accelerating continuously as I go through these replications, because I want to get to the new analyses. Um, slightly larger data set very good sampling. They were fairly careful to have some lower SES kids. Uh, this was the first time we analyzed data like this longitudinally. Um, they had infant test scores at 10 months and then early mental ability scores at two years. And that allowed us to fit a latent change model where we could get basically intercepts on all the kids and then magnitude of change between the two time points and fit the interaction parameters separately to those. Uh, this is on the intercept. And we get, uh, once again, I'm, I'm on a conference call. Uh, we get, once again, the usual effect uh, of heritability going up, again, in this case, quite dramatically from basically nothing up to uh, a very high proportion of the variance, um, whereas C goes down. Uh, same thing happens at four years. Um, by this time, interest in this general phenomenon had gotten quite widespread uh, in you know, the first decade of the, this century. And uh, people started doing, looking for it in all sorts of interesting places. Uh, Jeanette Taylor, who has access to all the standardized testing done in the Florida school system showed that uh, good teaching quality increases the heritability of intelligence. Uh, a really interesting study out of, I believe, UCLA shows that uh, children with high white matter integrity have higher heritability twins, higher heritability of intelligence. Um, this has gotten way more complicated since I made this slide because the molecular genetics have gotten way more complicated. There are, I don't want to oversell this particular part. There are at least some indications that uh, this was before we were talking, before people were really talking about polygenic risk scores, but that's essentially what it is. There is mixed evidence that polygenic risk scores may predict IQ better under conditions of high socioeconomic status. Uh, it happens for reading disability. Uh, however, there are two important domains where, it is for the most part, that the phenomenon has not been found. Uh, the first and most important one is in Europe. Uh, on the day in 2003 that, in fact, the, in the story that was published in the Washington Post, uh, Robert Pullman asked to comment on it, said, well, we took a look on our, in our TEDS data in London. We don't see it. Um, and since then, well, I think we're about to get to the meta-analysis. Since then, it's become pretty clear that whatever else is going on, this interaction does not occur in European and Australian data, which are the two other places that it's been looked for. It also doesn't happen in adults. Um, and I, I put in parentheses there with adult SES, because I think that's actually very important. Uh, 
adult socioeconomic status is a very different animal than childhood socioeconomic status. Your childhood socioeconomic status is imposed on you by the economic well-being of your parents. Now, are there potential genetic processes involved in parental SES? Sure, of course they are. But nevertheless, uh, parental SES is not in any simple way a function of childhood cognitive ability. That's not the case at all for adult socioeconomic status. Um, by the time we're adults, our socioeconomic status is probably just as much an effect of our cognitive ability as our cognitive ability is an effect of our socioeconomic status. Uh, so, and I say that because I'm having a grant review, as a matter of fact, that involves looking at adult socioeconomic status as a function of child, I'm sorry, adult cognitive ability as a function of childhood socioeconomic status, which I think is going to be a much more interesting phenomenon. Uh, very quickly, I'm trying to keep my eye on the clock here. This is, I, I love reporting on this study. It's unpublished for a variety of interesting reasons. Uh, socioeconomics, it fits with what I just said. Socioeconomic status, we talk about that as the environment moderating the heritability of intelligence. But socioeconomic status is obviously not strictly an environmental variable. It's any behavior genetist will tell you that genetic processes are involved in the determination of socioeconomic status. Another way of saying that is that we're not assigned at random to our socioeconomic status. Um, it's part of an obviously very complicated genetic and environmental process that children are born into a family with a particular kind of economic background. Uh, it's Obvious, it would be interesting to know how the heritability of intelligence changed when, this is going to sound ridiculous, when people are randomly assigned to different kinds of environments. Well, it turns out that if you're willing to accept uh, some limitations, mostly in terms of sample size, that that actually happened uh, in another NIH-funded study, the Infant Health and Development Program, the IHDP, uh, which I'm going to go over very quickly. It wasn't a twin study. It wasn't designed to study this phenomenon. It was a randomized controlled trial of an early intervention for cognitive ability in low birth weight preterm infants. Um, so it was a bunch of preterm infants randomly assigned to an enriched condition with home visits, parental support, educational uh, programs, or control families who got normal standard of care. Uh, and lo and behold, there were 95 pairs of twins who happened like, again, in the normal course of events, got, and because twins are often low birth weight, uh, got born into the IHDP. Uh, the twin pairs were randomized together into one condition or another, right? 21 MZ and 18 DZ pairs were in the experimental condition. 30 and 26 were in the control condition. Uh, let's skip that. Just a bunch of, they were mostly poor kids. Uh, an interesting thing about the IHDP is that I don't want to say it was a failure as an intervention to increase cognitive ability in general. It was not a dramatic success. Uh, you can find corners of the data where it looked like the intervention was successful. But by and large, the overall effects on the mean were not very dramatic. Uh, it was Clancy Blair who first suggested to me that, well, gee, I wonder if being raised in these enriched conditions might have had an effect on the twin correlations. Um, and lo and behold, they did. Uh, these are the MZ and DZ twin correlations for the treated, and this is an enhanced environment at random, and control conditions start, and then the rows are chronological, so from 12-month dailies uh, up through eight year, a bunch of eight-year-old achievement tests. And by the time the kids were eight years old, the heritability of the test was higher in the randomly assigned enhanced condition. Uh, unfortunately, none of those effects are significant because the sample is too small. Uh, I need to get around to publishing that on my blog. It, it, this paper got rejected more than any other paper I've ever written. Uh, OK, uh, that's history. Um, 
couple of years ago, Elliot Tucker Job and Tim Bates uh, conducted a meta-analysis uh, of the 30 or 40 finding of reports of this effect that had been published. And they found two basic things. First of all, in the United States, uh, the effect is reliable and it's there. Um, my, it wasn't the initial report, but the report that got all the publicity in 2003 was a little unrealistically large. Uh, but nevertheless, the mean effect in the United States uh, for a proceeding from this is now two standard deviations of SES to two standard deviations above the mean, an increase of you know more than 0.4 in the heritability of intelligence with C going down at a similar rate. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it showed that the effect only happened in the United States in black in this figure, but not in Europe in red. This is a funnel plot. Uh, and that, in fact, the difference between the um, American and European studies is itself significant. That that brings me I, so having having established that at least that the phenomenon happens in the United States with all of the inequality we have here. Uh, I mean, I do keep doing it just to show it. I mean, it's a finding I have an affiliation with, uh, but it in some ways also means now that it's been meta-analyzed and it's there, it's time to move on. Uh, and this is where that initial slide that I showed about the curvilinear effect, I, I think I've moved on from that explanation. And I think the most important way to think about it is that I don't know those of you who know me and my theoretical work know that I'm not a huge believer most of the time in heritability coefficients. I don't think they're the most useful way to describe these data. And in general, I think it's better to get down closer to the data themselves and describe these processes in terms of the twin correlations themselves. And if heritability is higher at high SES, that means one of two things, either the, or three, the identical twin correlation is higher, the fraternal twin correlation is lower, or both, right? And it's, it's often amazing when people talk about effects on heritability that if you ask them, well, why does that happen? Which of these three possibilities? They don't know. Right? And where we've moved in recent years is in the direction of trying to understand the actual developmental processes that lead to this. It's not just about heritability coefficients going down. These are actual up and down. These are actual kids having actual development, and we're, we're trying to understand those processes better. Uh, this is the slide uh, that, I don't know why it appeared as the second slide, but, uh, and again, I, I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to dwell on this. A very, very famous paper by Uri Bronfenbrenner and Steve Cece, uh, where they basically predicted that this was going to happen, that everything I've shown you is going to happen. Um, but what was interesting in back in 1994, this is a footnote from the study where they mentioned that literally in a footnote, they said, oh, by the way, we heard from these Norwegian uh, investigators that they have data that fits this hypothesis. Uh, I was teaching this in class when I saw this uh, and wrote Christian Tams, who unfortunately died last year, to ask if the whose data were still around, and lo and behold, they are. Uh, Norwegian conscript data, uh, a much larger sample than we've been dealing with. Um, and these are conscript data, and it's very important, given this a European sample. They're much older. They're mostly pre-Second World War data, when Norwegians were not very well educated. Um, they're conscripts. They're all male. Uh, they were given IQ tests when they uh, were conscripted on a, got a score on 1 to 10, parental education on a very coarse 1 to 4 scale. That's ability, nice and normally distributed. And parental education, and I'm going to have to, there are very interesting methodological details through here. Uh, most of the people didn't graduate from high school back then. Uh, so the education data are very, very skewed. Um, This is that same plot between 
uh, mid-parent, that is mean mom and dad education and IQ scores, uh, it slope-wise looks like you'd expect it to look, but what you can see is it's heteroscedastic. Uh, there is a lot of restriction and variance on the upper end, and this turns out to be a ceiling effect that as parents got better educated, the IQ test wasn't eat hard enough, um, so you were losing a lot of variance up on the top. Uh, we, uh, keeping my eye on the clock, we use a different model nowadays that does not model for the most part AC and E. Uh, it models up on top, can you see my cursor, uh, MZ and DZ correlations directly. And so what we're asking is how do MZ and DZ correlations change as a function of SES? Uh, and the answer, and I think a very interesting answer that I'm I'm not really going to be able to get into, but is the whole theoretical direction that we're going, is that the answer to the question of why does this effect happen is that in facilitative environments, high SES environments, DZ twins become less related to each other. That's the minus 0.12 there. That's the DZ twin correlation goes down in good environments. And of course, the DZ twin correlation going down makes the heritability go up. Uh, that's just a picture of it, and there's a very, this, this is all in behavior genetics last year, if you want to look it up. Um, kind of an interesting story that when we reparameterize the exact same data, but this time in traditional AC and E terms, uh, rather than just MZ and DZ twin correlation terms, uh, at first glance, the interaction went away, it, and we were mystified. I mean, it's the same data. How how Reparameterized, how can it go away? And the answer is that um, for a big portion of the data set, that is everybody who whose parents graduated from high school, the MZ twin correlation was more than twice the DZ twin correlation. Uh, so whatever's happening to drive down the DZ twin correlation is so dramatic that we were violating the classical twin model, and the the AC and E model was just disallowing it, and we weren't able to see our own phenomenon anymore. Um, it comes back if you allow the variance component to be negative. Uh, what we conclude is that well, this is that business about aging is from a part of the talk I didn't use here, but that. Uh, and it's, but it's true that as siblings age, they become more different from each other. And twin correlations for almost everything go down as kids grow up. That process happens faster in DZ twins, in fraternal twins. And it happens especially faster in DZ twins who are raised in good environments. OK, I wanted to make sure to get here because uh, <laughs> this is the study I'm funded for. Uh, the Louisville twin study is. Uh, a really, really fascinating study. It's one of the most famous twin studies that's ever been conducted in the United States. Uh, it was conducted between 1958 and 1999. Uh, unfortunately, it was closed down around the turn of the century, uh, this century, that is. Uh, the people who initiated Unfortunately, several of them died young. Adam Matheny retired young. Uh, and it was kind of just left to wither on the vine um, and shut down in 2000, basically, uh, with tons and tons of data on paper stuffed into file drawers. And moreover, even the data that had made it in the computers, they barely published any papers after 1990. Mo most of the interesting data was still unanalyzed. Uh, we had an R03, um, just ending right now, uh, to recover and rebuild the existing Louisville Twin Sample data set. Um, the LTS, without going into what's really, really important about the LTS, is that it is the most longitudinally intensive twin study that was ever conducted. Uh, the twins were tested upwards of a dozen times between birth and age 15 all in person, all with good, high quality, complete Wexler tests once they were old enough for those. Uh, 
So it, and there's at least a reasonable, not ideal, but reasonable socioeconomic range in the sample. So it is the, easily the greatest sample in the world, it may, except maybe it's a little small, to uh, study this phenomenon. Um, uh, I'm just going to talk about the 7 through 15 data right now, age 7 through 15, because these are the kids who took the WISC. Uh, that's, that's our model again. That's the modified twin correlation model. So no A, C, and E here. We're asking, what is it that makes identical and fraternal twin correlations go up and down? Uh, now, a problem is that the LTS, like pretty much every study I've shown you, is underpowered. And on the level of individuals, these are, these are plots of the magnitude of the interaction effect for all the individual subtests at all the individual ages. Uh, they tend to be in the right direction, but they're mostly NS because we're underpowered. So uh, what we've been doing for the last couple of years is building multivariate models to get us adequately powered tests of the phenomena that we're interested in. Um, that's just we're underpowered. Uh, and we do that much like uh, I showed you very quickly back with the National Merit Test a few minutes ago by fitting a common factor over the WISC subtest. We also fit some two interesting two and three factor models, which I'm not going to get into. Um, and uh, the important results are here. These are the regressions, the linear regressions of the of the uh, here of the the RMZ and RDZ of the MZ and DZ twin correlations on socioeconomic status, and the DZ twin correlations go down faster than the MZ twin correlations by and large, which means that in general A goes up and C goes down. Uh, this, this is just a quick animation from ages 7 through 15. Things get a little dicey at 15. That's the MZ twin correlation. That's the DZ twin correlation. That pattern is, given the, the diversity of ways and places and times this phenomenon has been studied, that is an amazingly consistent pattern. Um, now doing it in ACE terms rather than RMZ and RDZ, A goes up, C goes down. Not so much at age 15. Uh, some broad conclusions. Uh, I think it's well established in the United States that genetic differences among individuals are more apparent in strong proxile environments. Uh, somebody is oh, muted, and I'm, I'm uh, got neck. So if whoever you are, if you can remute just for another minute. Uh, this happens because facilitative environments allow individuals to seek suitable environments for themselves. And these processes, I haven't had time to go into a lot of detail about this, but we have simulations of all these processes. They happen faster in fraternal twins than they happen in MC twins. And that means that in facilitative environments, fraternal twins drift apart, the DZ twin correlation goes down, and the heritability goes up. That's a much more complicated story than genes are less important in poverty. I don't really think that gets at it. That this phenomenon is the result of a dynamic process of development that's reflected in the MZ and the DZ twin correlations. Um, a really important bottom line, I always like to conclude my talks on this subject uh, with this old slide back from the NCPP study. Um, this is what happens if you select your twin samples and leave out the poor twins. Okay, so what, what I've done here is this is in the NCTP, this is uh, the, the blue line that's going up is the heritability, and we can just focus on that. And in the full sample in the NCPP, it's not the Y scale, it's a little silly there, but the overall heritability in the full sample is about 0.2 or so. I then systematically left out the poorest pair of twins and recomputed everything, and then left out the two poorest sets of twins and the three poorest sets, moving this way as I truncate. And by the time you leave out the lowest quintile of, tw of uh, twins, the heritability starts to go up. 
middle class might start around here. And what this shows is that if you're sampling, if you're just going to the twin fair and getting the nice upper middle class twins who like to go to the twin fair, you are systematically and drastically going to underestimate the effects of family environment in those data. And 90% of the twin samples in the world do that. Uh, future directions. Our future directions are hopefully all in Louisville, uh, where, uh, I, you know, I can't help about, we're talking about where I hope our funding goes here. Uh, all those Louisville twins are now middle-aged. Uh, they haven't been studied for 20 years. We know where they all are. They're all headed from middle age into late middle age, and they're a remarkable opportunity to study how childhood socioeconomic status affects people as they grow. And these are, remember when I talked about adult socioeconomic status, these are people for whom we know both their childhood and hopefully their adult socioeconomic status. Uh, so we really want to follow these people up in midlife. We can study how uh, cognitive ability changes over time from childhood into middle age. Uh, there's a whole, even without collecting more data, there are whole huge interesting domains that we have not gotten into. There are extensive IQ scores on the parents and the siblings, all of which we've now recovered. We're working on analyses of those. Uh, there's just tons of work, interesting work to do in Louisville as well as elsewhere. Uh, I started on my collaborator slide, but, you know, I was reviewing 15 years of work on this, and it just would have been so extensive. So I just want to thank everybody. You all know who you are. Uh, that's my email. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm glad to send links to preprints or reprints or whatever. And thank you very much.